Hello, all of you mid-American gardeners. We're here and we're happy to answer questions about Zone 5 and anything that has to do with middle America. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of Aces. So my area is probably perennials, landscaping, and cut flowers. However, there are three extremely talented folks here with me today, and let's find out who they are, and you can direct your questions towards their expertise. I'm gonna throw it over first to Shane Coulter. Hi, Shane. Hi, I'm Shane Coulter. I'm one of the family owners of, uh, where am I? Culture Nurseries and, <laughs> and Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana, Illinois. And we grow and sell perennials, annuals, trees, shrubs, so I get to kind of deal with things of all natures all the time, and this year I've answered thousands and thousands of questions about different plants. So I'm learning more and more each year with the changing seasons. Excellent. And what is your question you're going to start with? Well, actually, I'm going to do I'm going to do show and tell Excellent. first because Perfect. I really want to get these to the front. First of all, I brought some colors that I thought were interesting. I, uh, I normally don't get real excited about colors, but then there's just some colors that are absolutely amazing. And this one right here is called a uh, Pyracallus. And this is it's one of the most unique colors I've ever seen at the nursery after all these years. And it's a bluish purple color and it, it's gonna bloom from now all the way until August, September. And it's just a beautiful bright color and it's a new color. It's something that just came out in the recent years. And then Celosia is something we all know. And this one's got this vibrant, it's even called intense with a Z. Mm. Z makes it cool. That's <laughs> if you put a Z in there. Just a really bright color that's really nice as well. And then finally, it's a, this little Yubi, you can see this purple color. It's, it's Persilane or Portulaca, and this is almost a can't-kill plant. It will grow in the driest conditions. You barely have to water it. And it's got these really unique colors, and it makes a great hanging basket or pot or anything along those lines. So it's just something that I think that uh, is really interesting, really easy to grow, and unique colors. Great bright colors. I Good like job. bright colors. Very good, very intense. Yeah, with a Z. You have to pronounce it different? Yeah. <laughs> Shane. That's right. <laughs> okay, thank you. And let's go next to you, Mary Ann Metz. Hello, everybody. I'm Mary Ann Metz. I am a horticulturalist and landscape designer. And perennials are probably my expertise, but I really like all ornamentals, trees, shrubs, you name it, I like it. And I would like to do show and tell. Go for it. All right. My first, one of my first collections as a, hoarder, as, a, as a gardener was tree peonies. I love the variety, variations, colors, sizes of tree peonies. The, the, the flowers are so exotic. And tree peonies, someone just asked me, oh, my peonies aren't in bloom yet. Well, no, herbaceous peonies are not, but tree peonies are. And they're a woody shrub. They, they have woody stems all winter long, lose all their leaves, but they bloom just before herbaceous, herbaceous uh, peonies, which should be any time now. But the variety of colors and texture, and I don't know if you guys can smell this, but this just, the fragrance is just outrageous. The colors are just terrific and very, very unusual. One of my favorites. And what's the best way to, I always, people ask this, what's the best way to keep a peony flower if you're gonna hold those in a vase? You, unfortunately, when you cut a tree peony, you're cutting a stem and that per permanently alters the shape of the plant. If you want to cut a long stem and put it in a long vase, you can do that. But if you do them short, you, you're not altering so much of the plant. So if you do right under the, the flower bud, you can float them. And boy, what a spectacular mm -hmm. floating flower. That Absolutely. Beautiful. beautiful. And some of them are just so beautiful. You don't need more than the one. Oh, oh my gosh, That's yeah. That's spectacular. This, this, just these four right are just a fabulous, fabulous arrangement. It really is. Well, good, thank you for sharing those. Four, one for each of us. Yeah, yes. Right. Coincidence. I got the, I'd call dibs on the paint. Okay, Oops. well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Marianne. And now we're gonna go next to a guy who knows about insects, Dr. Phil Nixon. Hi there, Phil. Hi, I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois in the Department of Crop Sciences. That, like Diane said, that means I know bugs. And I'm going to talk about uh, a uh, email that was ca came in on, and it says, I saw only one monarch butterfly this year. What is the Latin name for the specific milkweed, a type of Asclepius? Asclepius is a genus of milkweeds that monarch butterflies use for laying their eggs. I understood monarchs used a weedy type, it used to be found in ditches and roadsides all around our area. But when I looked for that to gather some seeds this fall, couldn't find any. Do seed catalogs sell this variety? 
it's pretty unlikely that you're going to find a seed catalog that will be selling what is considered to be kind of a, not quite a noxious weed, but getting kind of close to it. Uh, there are several Asclepias varieties that are out there, and I think it kind of depends on maybe how you hold your mouth or where you live or whatever the case may be. I was, we were just talking before the uh, session that, uh, that uh, I had never seen any, uh, any uh, caterpillars in my yard on Asclepius tuberosa, which is the butterfly weed, but Shane said he sees them heavy on, on ones around his nursery. So uh, I've had the best luck with blood flower, which is Asclepius cursivacchia. That happens to be a subtropical species that is not hardy. You have to start it every year and you treat it as an annual. Um, other people have had very good luck with Asclepius incarnata, which is a swamp milkweed. I've had quite a few living on that in my own yard. Um, other people, the one that, that, the, that the writer is talking about is Asclepius syriaca. And, um, and I have heard people talk about finding a lot of them. I usually have about 30 or 40 plants that come up on their own in my yard. I think in 26 years, I've seen one caterpillar on that. Uh, but probably 20 on a blood flower. So it depends which one they go to. Uh, one concern has been is, is the Syriaca apparently does not have much in the way of cardiac glycosides, and so it may not be producing really toxic butterflies. Uh, Cursivacchia of a blood flower is supposed to be exceedingly toxic. Uh, Turberosa, somewhere in between. So uh, one of the ways that, butter, that monarchs get, a, get around in life is being such that they give uh, birds a vomiting reaction when they try to eat one and they learn to avoid it. Uh, and uh, But there's another concern, another writer wanted to know how come, what our take is on why there's fewer monarch butterflies. A good reason last year was it was exceedingly rainy for the first half of the year and there are fungal diseases that'll take up out essentially all caterpillars and so that would have really knocked them back. Uh, generally it's thought that across the country it's the loss of, of weedy roadsides and, and habitat food plants for them. And so gardeners can plant several different kinds of Asclepias or bunkweeds in their yard to help. And there's been some concerns also with where the Midwestern groups of, of monarchs overwinter, and that is in the mountains of Mexico. One's on the West Coast. Uh, they they uh, overwinter in, in uh, central California. One's on the east coast in southern Florida, but the ones in the Midwest go all the way down into the mountains of Mexico, and there's been some logging and some problems down there too. So there's a variety of things that are kind of challenging to monarchs. Wow, there's a lot there. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting, okay. Well, good question, and thank you very much for that. Let's go next to our quiz, the Did You Know? <music> Oh, yes, we enjoyed that one. <laughs> Several people on the round the pan well, maybe one person around the panel said that she already does that. <laughs> so I don't want to give away who it is. Yeah, we won't say who it is. Okay. <laughs> well, let's go to the phone lines. And Teresa has a question for us on line two. Hi there, Teresa. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, I'm having a lot of trouble with uh, the squirrels. Squirrels are eating up my hens and chickens. I can't plant anything without them digging up little small iris gloves. I have squirrel problems. What could I do? Uh, the, um, <clears throat> they will be repelled by hot sauce repellent, which is uh, essentially when they make Tabasco sauce, they have some stuff that's really nasty at the bottom of the barrel, and they tend to, uh, tend to distill that out, and so it's considerably hotter than Tabasco sauce, but my understanding is much of it comes from the same company, McKellany or whatever it's called. Uh, but at any rate, uh, that, is, that is quite effective, but it will wash off with each rain, so you have to reapply it. Um, and I don't know much else to kind of protect them. I've seen, you can put a, put a chicken wire cage over the top of the hen and chickens, but that kind of defeats the reason why you had an ornamental plant there if you're gonna hide it under something that's not very ornamental. Uh, for bulbs, particularly those that are deeper, such as daffodils and things like that, uh, many times it's a good idea to plant those in a pillow of, uh, of uh, hardware cloth 
and the the squirrels can't get through through the hardware cloth on all sides of the, of the bulbs, but uh, but the shoots can come up through it. That's one way of avoiding that. For something real shallow rooted such as iris, I really don't know what you could do associated with them. So the repellents, though, are probably the most effective. I would mm -hmm. I would imagine, but but the real secret to the repellents is to keep after the application. You can't just do it once and expect them to go away. It's as it rains and the the chemical or whatever product you're using disseminates it's you 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 have to keep using it it's like training kids you just keep at it and it and it's kind of fits into that idea of how do you keep squirrels away from a bird feeder well certain things work but as they as they point out if you it only works if you have dumb squirrels <laughs> smart squirrels will eventually <laughs> defeat every bird feeder protection there is against squirrels getting into it uh, so uh, Kind of the same thing happens in trying to protect your plants. As long as you've got dumb squirrels, you can get away with it pretty well. But when you get the smart one, they're going to figure it out. They're Olympic athletes. Yeah, that's right. They are. They are. So, all right. Well, thanks for that question. Let's go to line three. And Tom has a question as well. Line three, Tom. Yep, I've got a question. Um, I avidly grow or burn a lot of uh, wood during the uh, wintertime. How much is the best time to throw on the wood burning, the potash? onto the garden, or can I throw too much actually on it? I'm going to say yes, you can throw too mm -hmm. much on it, um, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know. Does anyone else want to? Well, it, it's usually, a, 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 the recommendation I've read is usually five to ten pounds per hundred square feet, which seems like a lot to me also, mm -hmm. but potash is going to raise the pH, and some plants will like that and some won't, but it depends on what the soil pH is to begin with. So you want to be careful, certainly. Uh, take, a, take a pH reading probably beforehand and you know, be careful about it, but don't put it all in one spot. Right. That's for sure. So. And, and probably fall is the best time. I've also read the fall because you can actually till it into your soil. It has time to uh, make, react, make the soil react. So that's probably the better time if you're okay. going to do it. All right. Very good. Well, we don't have many phones, so we're going to go back around to you, viewer, uh, to the viewer email, and I'm going to start with you, Shane. All right. I've got a, uh, a, a good question. We had a viewer that said they bought two Carl Foresters uh, through the mail, which I will say, not necessary. You have some good local garden centers, <laughs> and there's no reason to order plants through the mail. You should check your local garden centers first, and Carl Foresters are very well grown in the Midwest. So we'll, we'll go past that. And they received directions <laughs> through that mailing, which if they would have bought at a local garden center, they would get the directions right there locally. But they didn't know when to plant them. And it really depends uh, what they look like. But in general, if you get a potted plant, this really goes across the board. If you get a potted plant, you can plant them any time. You can put them, the light, the, uh, they're housed in a, their own little you know, life support system. So you can plant them. Grasses, you do want to wait or be careful how late you plant them. You really don't want to get them, you know, everybody's got a different day, but after September 30th, we really avoid them because they don't have time to root in. And a winter like this one is a perfect example. When they didn't get rooted in, they, you lose a lot of grasses. But anytime this time of year through the summer, again, I tell people, they say, well, July is a bad time. Well, if you plant it in May, you're going to be watering in July. So get them in the ground, get them rooted up as soon as possible. Um, there's again it's only a bad time if it's too late in the season other than that I think you're going to be fine watch the water yes grasses don't need a lot of water but all plants need to establish through drying out getting wet drying out um, so that's the answer to the question but but you would get all these answers at a local garden center if you buy them <laughs> you don't have to guess or you can always call here though <laughs> <laughs> or both, or both. <laughs> great well thank you for that and now Marianne well I have another show and tell um, I collect, again, after the tree peonies, I collect Japanese maples, which takes up lots more room. But I just wanted to show the variation in color and texture of some of the Japanese maples that are available. Um, you can see that. That's almost like a bouquet also, isn't it? That's yeah. gorgeous. I just am totally enamored with them. The textures and colors, look at the fine textures, some of these, and uh, the colors just, and this is spring color. And they're beautiful in the fall. Their fall colors are all are just as stunning. It's really hard and to know. There's a lot of different shapes there. You can't tell from the leaves, but you can see there's some weepers in there and some yes, uprights. Yes, absolutely. You just there's so such a variation in this particular thing. But just another one of my collections, which I just love. And um, 
Boy, they, they do really well. They like a little more protection in the wintertime. Uh, Phil was just saying he can't do them so well or too many years because of wind. But And yes, here in the Midwest, we do have a lot of wind. But um, if you have a protected uh, environment in your backyard or that little microclimate, they do quite well, actually. Yeah, they, some of us more in open areas it's don't a have challenge. as much luck. <laughs> yeah. It's not luck. If you have a luck. huge garden, you generally don't have a lot of Japanese maples. That's <laughs> <laughs> they usually, I've always found that if somebody has a huge garden, they have a lot of Japanese maples, they don't. And if they have a lot of Japanese maples, they generally don't have a big garden. Oh, that's interesting. I have a big garden. You have a big, well, <laughs> I've been to your house. You have nice everything. Oh, <laughs> very good. All right. Well, thank you for bringing those in. They're yes, gorgeous. Sir. All right, Phil, let's go to you next. So as this is not a question, but as a gardener here in the Midwest, I would very much appreciate hearing your program address the decline of honeybee populations here in Illinois and the causes. Well, the first thing is is that, uh, is that we haven't had as much of a honeybee decline in Illinois as many other states have been, probably more than anything because most of our honeybee uh, that we have are, are, uh, are either hobbyist grow, uh, beekeepers or they're ones that are localized beekeepers. Where we see the decline the most in, in honeybees is going to be associated with migratory beekeepers that will, will go, to, go across country. Uh, essentially, uh, I think it's three quarters of all the honeybee colonies in the, in the country end up uh, pollinating almond orchards in California at some time during the year. And it's in those types of situations where they're loading uh, many hives onto a flatbed trailer, a semi, and driving it during the night and these bees are always trying to find a new source of food in a new place and they don't know where they are and all this sort of stuff that we see the colony collapse disorder effects and some of the other effects but but nationwide and as well as in Illinois our main are it's a multi-pronged approach uh, insecticides can have an effect uh, the insecticides and fungicides that beekeepers use in their own hives has been shown to have an effect Mites associated with a beekeeper, with the bees, are having an effect. There are diseases that are having an effect. There's a loss of habitat that's having an effect. And anytime anybody comes up and says, the problem is blank, they're wrong. Because it's a multi-pronged thing. It is not so simple as if we get rid of blank, we can solve the problem. That's kind of like saying we're gonna solve a political problem by getting rid of one person. So at any rate, uh, the point is it's a multi-pronged approach. There's very thing, many things associated with it. But in Illinois, we tend to be relatively blessed with a relatively small amount of honeybee decline compared to some other states, particularly south, southern states such as Texas and so on that have a lot of migratory beekeepers in Florida, that sort of thing. Okay, multi-pronged. So doing something in all of those categories. Yeah, reducing your amount of insecticide use, mm -hmm. particularly to flowering plants, mm -hmm. makes a big difference, uh, you know, doing the, uh, uh, making sure that uh, that you're kind of supporting and having some blooming flowers throughout the year for the bees to feed mm -hmm. on. Uh, even if they're not your bees and you're getting them in there, that all helps. And it helps the native bees too as well because the honeybee is an exotic bee. That, uh, everything ran fine here before the pilgrims brought the honeybees over. So, uh, so you know, it's uh, there, are, there are native pollinators that need help too. Okay, very good. Thank you, Phil. Well, we're going to go to the phone lines, and let's start with line four, Robin, and she has a question. Line four. Hi, I'm glad Phil's there. I have what we're pretty sure is um, termites in one of my planting beds, and um, there's no vegetables there. It's just flowers, but what do I do to kill it? And, and the bed had... Uh, cocoa hole mulch tilled into it, and th the clump that we found the bugs in was a clump of kind of clay with the uh, mulch attached to it. And could that be the reason we're getting termites? Because I've never had them in my flower beds before. Termites are very, very much tied to having a lot of moisture associated with them. And they will actually get into some of our garden plants. They will tunnel into the stems of rhubarb and geraniums. Uh, they will, of course, will get in mulch. We recommend that the mulch be no thicker than two to three inches 
because that allows that mulch to dry out between waterings or rainfalls and eliminates, for the most part, the termites in it. They need to have a 97.5% relative humidity to survive. And so as long as that's the case, that greatly reduces the problem associated with it. The clay soils probably help keep that moisture in there. Whether you do something about it or not is kind of a heck if you do, heck if you don't scenario. If you do something about them and, and, uh, and treat in that area, then they have to go look for another source of food and they may go to your house. If you don't do anything, that may allow the colony to build up to where then they go to your house. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's whatever you want to do. Uh, generally, uh, they are going to look around for various sources of food. There are baits that can be used. Uh, there, are, there are direct spray applications that can be used. I would suggest that whether you do something or not, that, uh, that you either self-inspect or have your house inspected, maybe on an annual, but certainly no, no, less, often than every three, no, no less often than every three years. Uh, because uh, if, if they're in your yard, they're close enough to hit your house. Okay, very good. Well, moving right along, let's go to line two. And Vicki has a dogwood question. Line two, Vicki. This is on red twig dogwood. Yes. Um, I think it has scales. And I've had scales on them, I think. It's a little white, brown, not evenly brown. And I also have had worms get on them. They're probably maybe an inch long. And, well, there's something on the underneath side sometimes. And then uh, then I get worms on them, and they're about, they're white, kind of a little fuzzy mm -hmm. with a stripe down their back. And I wonder why. Okay, probably what you're looking at is the, is the scales are probably oyster shell scale. And I'm looking in the book to see when you would treat for that because oyster shell scales are not going to be controlled with a dormant oil spray. You have to do a crawler spray when those crawlers are out. And I don't keep it in my mind. That's why I write it down in the book. I have uh, a question for her while you're looking. Well, I've got it found, but go well, ahead. You, oh, <laughs> go ahead and tell her then. Uh, but you would usually do that when bridal respirea is in late bloom or is finished bloom, we're in central Illinois right in the middle of full bloom right now on Van Hoot or, or bridal respirea. And you could use an insecticidal soap or a pyrethroid such as found in eight insect spray at that time when they are out. Uh, and they're little gray crawlers that'll be out on the, on the foliage. The, uh, the caterpillar type thing is a sawfly and uh, that's going to be controlled with your eight insect spray and it'll work pretty well on that as well as rotenone or carbaryl sold as uh, seven insecticide. Now have you found that scale gets controlled when you rejuvenate the red twig? You know when you keep the older branches cut out? Because I've actually pretty much eliminated it in my garden by rejuvenating oh, that's great. it. You know yeah. taking out the older branches yeah. and only you know so, I haven't made a recommendation for dogwood, but it makes sense that it would. Uh, when you're growing like red twig where you will cut it down, mm -hmm. the scale is only on the above ground parts. And if you cut away all of the top part, which I commonly will recommend uh, on Euonymus scale, mm -hmm. and, dest and destroy or remove all of that material, then theoretically you have no scale left. However, you have to keep your eye on it because everything will be nice and fresh and soft and easily mm -hmm. attacked by that scale that comes up, but you're right, that's, uh, it's actually, only on the top growth. So I actually remove it when it looks good and use it in big right. displays. Okay. So I don't even wait, I mean, when I use it that much, I don't get scale on my dogwood, red twig, so. But anyway, thank you for that question and the pronged attack for it. Okay, <laughs> let's go to line three and Pauline. Hi, Pauline. Line I'm three. Five. Line. Are you Pauline? Yes. Then go for it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I just wondered if Shane could please repeat the name of the last plant that he saw with the purple. This is, uh, yeah, Portulaca. Let's see if we got a camera on me. I believe it's Port. This one here? Is that the one you're looking for? There's a little delay, so. Yeah, there is. Well, the, the, the one that droops it. down with the purple flower is Portulaca. Yeah. And that's he, a, it's a, yeah. P-O-R-T-U-L-A-C-A. -A -A. Yeah. 
And I some think varieties are called moss roses. Moss, exactly. moss roses, yeah. And then this, I think this variety is in the UB family, Y-U-B-I. They've got some really nice colors in that family. And I think this is called UB, but it's so easy to grow. It's one of those hanging yeah. baskets that when you go on vacation and all of them die, this is the one that's that still not, alive. Exactly. So that's why it's my favorite. <laughs> and, uh, I often get them to self-sow. Oh, yeah, oh, yes. absolutely. absolutely. So you don't clean them up at... Yeah, they're on. We have some nice right. ones on the floor of our greenhouses. Sure. Yes, yeah, exactly. They, they, That's yeah, exactly they grow, right. and the next year we've got some new ones. And cracks of the so. driveway. And they're yeah. easy yes, to absolutely. transplant around. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's a really, it's, it's a really a easy one to. Great grow. plant. I got nervous when I saw it. it. Was a question from me. I was thinking, oh no, you someone's can not all these special. <laughs> well, that I was much better. Thank our great viewers. Thank you so much, and for you folks, all of your expertise. We hope that you'll get out and have a great week gardening. Goodbye.